Well, as uh, Nanette said, my name is Curly Raven Houghton, and I'm the executive director of the Davis C. Driscoll Center at the University of Maryland. And I'd like to thank her and the museum for inviting us to be a part of this celebration of the Harlem Renaissance. But let me tell you a little bit about the Davis C. Driscoll Center and then uh, Dr. Driscoll, whose name the center bears. The center uh, honors Dr. Uh, Driscoll and his legacy and his groundbreaking work on the study and the, the documentation of African-American artists. He is considered a foremost authority, especially with his seminal text, Two Centuries of African-American Artists, 1750 to 1950. Uh, many scholars had no knowledge that artists of color were working in the United States during that time. So Dr. Driscoll has not only educated the community that appreciated art, but also the scholars that taught art had to come to Dr. Driscoll to find out about the fullest story of the American dream. And we often talk about that. So this conversation is going to be not so purely academic, but a little more intimate, a little more personal. And I'll try to draw out of him some tidbits from stories and encounters with some of the most important artists and cultural historians uh, that have worked in the US. So the David C. Driscoll Center, and of course, Dr. Driscoll. This is some of the background, and Nanette had uh, spoken to you about David's uh, important background and how he got to become such a singular and important figure in America. We consider Dr. Driscoll to be a national treasure. So the title of this ex uh, talk is Living Legacy, a conversation with Dr. David C. Driscoll, artisan scholar and a national treasure. Dr. Drisco, who recently received one of the nation's highest honors and prestigious awards by being inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Prior to that, I think two years ago, he was inducted to the National Academy of Art as a uh, member, a new member. This is amazing because not only has he had a stellar career as an art historian, but as a studio practicing artist at the same time. And that's how I was first introduced to Dr. Driscoll. So we're on this national tour. We're taking his story around the country, a story of cultural and artistic achievement that celebrates the African-American journey through the eyes, experiences, and voice of Dr. Driscoll. Many of you already know of Dr. Driscoll's amazing career and legacy as a seminal figure in the study of African-American art and his contributions to the larger artistic canon. We had a number of individuals at lunch today who were so pleased to see David. They knew people over the years that he had a relationship with. And what came out of that lunch was the importance of sharing these stories with each other. Not all these stories are written down, but when we tell the story, personally tell the story through a narrative, it allows us to connect with that human experience. David has written a lot, has spoke a lot, has been published in many journals, exhibition catalogs, but we've been inspired to share that story in a most intimate and personal way, to hear his voice tell those stories and what he's witnessed along that long journey is very important. This is a human story of triumphs, an American story of faith and a story of our long journey of hope and courage. When we look to the culture and artistic accomplishments of the African-American community, we often turn that as a special moment in history situated between three national defining events, the great migration of blacks from the South to the North, the beginning of World War I, and of course, the Great Depression. This volatile social environment composed of continued racial segregation, discrimination in housing and labor, returning black GIs who have fought heroically in the battlefields of Europe, a group of visionary black intellectual leaders who offered a new vision of an old stereotypical Negro. Now coined the New Negro Movement, this transformative artistic and cultural crucible, although brief when we look at it, became extremely popular and known as the Harlem Renaissance. Dr. Driscoll is a child of the Harlem Renaissance. Many of his teachers and mentors were participants in that movement and a number of them were considered the founders of the Harlem Renaissance, such as Elaine Locke and Langston Hughes. Here we see David as a student, 1953. Now, David was a student at uh, Howard University. 
which is an amazing story in itself, how he got to Howard University. I'm going to try to draw that out because he arrived in a classroom without being enrolled as a student. He was going to college. They said, what are you doing here? He says, I'm going to college. <laughs> well, you can't just come and sit in the, in the classroom. He had taken a train from Georgia or North Carolina. North Carolina. With a little sack with some tomatoes that he had grew himself for lunch along the way. I think $5 or $20, something like that. He was going to college. No entrance exam, no application, but he was going to college. And eventually it allowed him to come to Howard University. But the Harlem Renaissance, which is a great symbol of the Renaissance, this, this photograph is an exhibition by James Van Der Zee. So this was a glorious moment where you had an intersection of labor, intelligentsia, and cultural opportunity located in one site in Little Africa is what they called it. It was the largest number of African Americans or Africans outside of Africa, located in any location outside of Africa, was this Little Africa, Harlem. That was critically important because not only did you have a major doctor in one uh, apartment building, you had Cab Calloway on another apartment building, you had a janitor next door, all living in the same environment. I think those are critical elements. The next image, Langston Hughes. Perhaps the mission of the artist is to interpret beauty to people the beauty within ourselves. And I think David has always attempted to do that, to give to the public the beauty of black people. Here's David. Before we get to David, the post of the Negro would begin to beat in Harlem by Langston Hughes and Elaine Locke, who was also someone that defined the Harlem Renaissance. And next you'll see Dr. Driscoll with a number of individuals in uh, D.C., the Bernard Aden Gallery. You see him to the left, this young man? It's Dr. Driscoll there. So he was around these individuals that had, had a legacy and a connection to the Harlem Renaissance, and they were transferring that message and story to David. These are artists that David knew personally or dealt with in some kind of professional capacity, so he knew their story. Here he is at Fisk University, Walter Williams, Jacob Lawrence, and Aaron Douglas. So this story that he's going to tell you is a story about personally being related and engaged with these artists, not just a historical document, but a witnessing, and that's important. And he knew a number of these cultural heroes. Here you have him with Romare Bearden, Aaron Douglas, Carlton Moss. Look at how he's posing here, isn't that interesting? Here is with Aaron Douglas and Erna Bontips, who was at Fisk University, had just finished at Fisk when David came to Fisk. He's just retired. So there was a relationship and a connection. And he worked with most of these individuals. So this was an important period for David. It set the foundation for his own work, the golden period of the Harlem Renaissance. So David was born on June 7, 1931, in Edenton, Georgia, to a family of sharecroppers. And I'm sure no one in Edenton had heard of the Harlem Renaissance. But he made up for that in his travels and his journeys. He educated himself, and he was motivated to tell that story, not just his story, and the story of his uh, colleagues and other artists, but he wanted to tell the story of his family. He wanted to bring that story forward, that he had something to be proud of and to celebrate and not to apologize for. Historically, African Americans have been asked to negotiate their presence and value in public constantly, to defend and assert their value that was always questioned and suspect. But David came from an environment of great pride, and encouragement and support. At this moment, I'd like to bring the maestro to the stage, 
Dr. David C. Driscoll. So I have a few formal questions that I'll ask him to get him going, and then I'll let him loose, all right? Because <laughs> he has stories to tell you. But I think one that's been really important to me is when you think about a generation of artists that in most cases had no models to encourage them to make art. They studied, many of them, not all of them had a chance to study but they had great faith in their talent and they were motivated to create works of art. They were motivated to document their reality, that new Negro. Not the old Negro that was apologetic, ashamed, and guilt-ridden by the stain of color. These individuals were asserting a different kind of value, a different kind of reality. So the first question I want to ask Dr. Dressel is to talk a little bit about how the Harlem Renaissance set this professional foundation that had not existed before, where they were considered artists, exhibitors. And I know during the WPA program, which followed, unless you had an exhibition record, you could not get hired to work in the Works Project Administration. So where were these artists to get an exhibition record if they weren't shown anywhere? Well, I as Curly has said, uh, the period prior to the founding and organization of what, you know, became the Harlem Renaissance, the new Negro movement, uh, pride in racial pride, um, the notion that we were not, as a race, the people who had been depicted in the stereotypes. Um, we were culturally aggressive in that we had certain standards about our lifestyles, uh, our educational principles, etc. And so the, the New Negro Movement was to prove to a very skeptical public that black people had culture that was consistent with the ideals of what would be described as the highest ideals in American culture. And he took what might be referred to as the founding fathers. There were women who were involved also, but the men who were employed in various institutions at that time, such as Charles S. Johnson, Allen Locke, E. Franklin Frazier, and others, they decided that they had to make clear the notion that there was a new Negro on the scene, mm -hmm. not the one that had previously uh, been defined uh, with uh, head down and just barely making a, a statement about his or her livelihood. Du Bois had, uh, of course, already defined that perimeter by saying that it was difficult for African Americans, for black people, to say who they were in the context of the American definition because they had to live in two worlds. They had to be black by the standards of what blackness meant, and they had to try and compete in a world in which the American ideal was education, the hierarchy of living, and so forth and so on. So how are you going to do that if you are denied the privilege to participate fully in the American experience, in American society, in jobs, in education, etc.? And so this double consciousness that Du Bois talked about was um, characterizing the life of the average, not just the educated, what have you, uh, the talented 10th that he wrote about, but everybody who was considered colored in the United States. Everybody was under one title. And I've often said, and you've heard me say this as we go to audiences around the nation, I've, uh, I don't know whether it's a 
um, whether it's a blessing or a curse. I've lived through all kinds of nomenclature of naming. Uh, Negro, colored, Afro-American, uh, black, African-American. I don't know what's next. I just like to be human. Mm -hmm. I just like to be an American because I think I'm one of the proudest Americans out there. I think I've reaped the benefits of the American system in so many ways that I can tell this story and I can <laughs> assume that you're describing my legacy as something that I can experience in my own lifetime. Now, legacy is supposed to be after. Well, this one we're doing while you're here. Because so <laughs> we want this story told now. <laughs> so to make a long story short, and he very often has to ring me in when I get started talking, he said, could you get back to the point of what we were talking about? Well, to make a long story short, I'm simply saying that the Harlem Renaissance is the product of a long period of progression. Didn't start in, 19, in uh, 1918. It started many, many years prior to that, but it couldn't be recognized mm. until you had those people who were able to articulate it and to say exactly what it was. And to a certain extent was, I'm tired, I'm not gonna take it anymore. None of the nonsense that's out there. I too sing America. I am an American and let's uh, prove it by way of our culture, by way of uh, our patriotism. You know, First World War had just taken place and had black soldiers going to Europe, including Tanner and others, sure. artists. And so working its way on into the, 21st, uh, into the 20th century in which you would have the acknowledgement that African Americans had been part and parcel of the cultural scene all along. In some cases they had done work that had been claimed by their white owners in slavery. They were not given the credit for building the great buildings of the South. And those of you who read the, the book that I, uh, the catalog for two centuries, one of the uh, examples that I pointed out was the old courthouse in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where one gentleman in his diary points out, he says, yes, I'm given the credit for building that building, but my mechanic slaves, John Jackson built that building. I supervised it. And he was honest enough to say, I got the credit for it. Well, that was common. The plantation houses all over the South, the great houses and what have you. We know um, the mechanic slaves, as they were very often called. They were the builders. Uh, they were the ones who, of course, not only uh, cultivated the crops and harvested the fields and things like that, but none of that was recorded in the compendium. In American society, we know. If it isn't written down, nobody believes it. We are not a part of that great oral tradition from Africa and other such places. Now, African Americans were because very often that's the way they preserved their history, was through the oral tradition. But if it isn't in print in our society today, forget it. As far as we are concerned, it didn't happen. Sure, sure. So much of that happened that has been lost. And so, it was the mission of the writers, of the artists, the poets, the sculptors of the Harlem Renaissance to record, to make sure that their contributions were known. And so they were artists and artisans in all of those fields, many of whom had not been recognized prior. They were the ones who were beginning to be looked upon as creators. And so that was a new kind of thing for black people and Harlem was the center of it. And from Harlem, it spread out into other parts of the country. You raise a real good issue here. They brought something with them, not just talent and ambition. They brought something with them. They brought the experience they had had many as sharecroppers or children from the former plantation. Mm -hmm. And they had a pride, even though it was impoverished, they had a pride and a sense of history that they did not want to deny and apologize for. So with that, I want to give, let your story in some way represent our story. 
If you could, I know we're a little ahead when we're talking about meeting these artists and being inspired by them and working with them. Could you take us back a little bit to your early days in the South, in Edenton? You went to a segregated school, one-room schoolhouse, if I'm not mistaken. Can you tell us how you got from Edenton to Howard University? Mm. Well, you don't have four hours, <laughs> but I will try and do it in Because I've had to listen to it, for, but anyway. <laughs> Do the, the edited version, all right? I'll try to do it in four minutes. <laughs> How about that? Well, Edenton, Georgia, you know, people say, where in the world is that? Well, it's like 20 miles from Macon, Georgia. Maybe you've heard of Macon, Georgia. James Brown came from, you know, that part of the world, and Macon, Augusta, and, and they had names that um, you have some uh, popular American hero, heroes that uh, would... Uh, be connected. Edenton was a little sleepy town of about 15,000 people and uh, about 60 miles southeast of Atlanta. And as I said, closer to Macon, which is the largest city in the area. And my, as far as I can go back, um, uh, I can trace my ancestry back to around 1820 when um, a slave uh, by the name of John Driscoll, in biblical terms, begat a son by the name of, <laughs> of Douglas Driscoll, and then by um, uh, 1872 uh, uh, or so forth, begat a son by the name of William Driscoll, and, and William had a son named George Driscoll, and I'm the son of George Driscoll. Uh, George was born in 1905, I was born in 1931. Edenton, Georgia. People say, Edenton, where, what, why do I know about Edenton? Well, probably because um, um, Alice Walker was born there. But I always tell people, well, I was born there before she was. <laughs> so, um, and uh, the Walker family, my father was a Methodist minister at that time. He was not trained in theology and all of that, but uh, up through the line. And uh, the Walker family was a member of my father's church. I didn't know them because we moved away uh, between my fifth and sixth birthday. So I really didn't attend school there. Um, there was a little one room schoolhouse near um, Hunts Chapel Church where my sisters, I had three sisters ahead of me. My sisters attended that school, but I, my parents moved to Western North Carolina and what we commonly refer to as Appalachia. And, um, and I assume they mo moved there because my mother had relatives who lived there and who were also sharecroppers. And so we became sharecroppers. And there I attended a one-room school, a four-room high school in which I drove 35 miles on the bus every day up in the mountains and the hills going up towards Asheville. 35 miles there, 35 miles back every day, passing about five beautiful edifices along the way that I couldn't attend because of my color. And um, that uh, scenario of being brought up in that environment, but having parents who were encouraging and saying, and my only playmate was uh, a, a young man, that, uh, a white kid who lived next door, and that's one of the things that we don't always hear about in the South. Very often, your property is contiguous with the property of a, a white person or what have you, and you have to get along with that person because that's the way life is. Uh, the, the, the local whites, five or six in our community, didn't have a car. My father did, so they would come on Saturday and borrow my father's car to go to town. That kind of cooperation, sure. you never read about that kind of thing, you see. So it wasn't an isolated community where you didn't know any white people, or, or white people didn't know any black people. It was really a cooperative venture, but it was a limited one. Mm. But you didn't go to school together. You didn't go to the same churches and what have you. But it was a community that was, it's hard to describe it in the sense that you had to cooperate with each other to live there. It was just that difficult. So that was the environment in which I I think grew. that traveled with you, didn't it? That sense of experience yes. and values. Yes, and my father being uh, uh, a Methodist minister in that 
area, you know, when it comes to religion, people are very careful about their associations. My father was AME, African Methodist Episcopal. There must be some AMEs in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> but there is AME Zion. At that time, there was CME, Colored Methodist Episcopal. There was also another one, I don't recall. The, you know, if, it's, if you have five black people, you're gonna have five different church uh, associations. And so there was no AME church in the area where we moved in Appalachia. So my father became Baptist. So I grew up between these two uh, religious experiences of AME and Baptist. And so when I went to college, I said, I don't like either one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became uppity. And, <laughs> and so I, tell us how you got to college now. Tell us I, how you got there. Well, I became Congregationalist. <laughs> Moved on up a little higher. Um, and so, which is now United Church of Christ. Uh, and I got there because I had worked in the fields all summer, saved about $45. I had uh, plowed cotton, chopped cotton, and done all the things that one does in those communities, and saved about $45. And um, I was uh, the class salutatorian uh, out of my 24 classmates in this little school. And I'll never forget the principal for not making me uh, valedictorian because I thought I was smarter than anybody else. At least my parents told me I was. <laughs> so um, they said, go to college. We hadn't counselor. There were five teachers in this little, counting the principal in this little four-room school. But they were good teachers. And I'll tell you something else that you probably didn't know about the black schools in the South. In those days, black students, black teachers, or what have you, you couldn't attend the white universities. You couldn't come to the Ohio State University. Now, black people in North Carolina, where I grew up, or Georgia, or what have you, could come to Ohio State University. How? Because they couldn't go to the University of North Carolina yeah, okay, because of Georgia. segregation. Yeah. So the state of North Carolina would pay you to come to Columbus, to go to Ohio State University. So we had better teachers, because our teachers went to Michigan <laughs> for graduate work, to Ohio State University, to Columbia, and I, you know, I'm a product of that period. We had the best teachers. And when, uh, I, and I'm getting off the subject, but I do that. You got on the train. And, and, and when, um, in 2001, when I was down at the Met Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a young man, uh, uh, a Caucasian gentleman, who had graduated from the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, was interviewing me. He was uh, interviewing me on um, National Public Radio. And he said, now your, our collection was at the Met Museum, collection of African American art. He said, now, here you are, X number of years later, you grew up here in Appalachia. Tell me what it was like to go to the Mint Museum when you were a child. And I looked at him like he had come from Mars. I said, didn't you know I couldn't go to the Mint Museum? And he was shocked, he was surprised. He said, you didn't have money to go to the Mint Museum? I said, no, I didn't have the color to go, I'm black. He had never read about that. He'd mm. never heard it. That's not in the books. I understand. Okay. Yes, yes. So I'm going around the barn to tell you all of this. So I said, no, no. And I told him the whole story, and he was just shocked. Mm. So you couldn't go to the Mint Museum. And no, no, I couldn't go to the Mint Museum. Then they improved, maybe 10 years later, and they had Negro Day. You could go one day a week. So he was just so shocked that here I am, a so-called art expert who didn't have any art training as a child, 
went to the museum only late in life on Negro Day, and yet somebody's calling me an authority. Mm. He couldn't figure that out. But that was a pattern. So he said, well, aren't you angry? And I said, no, what good would anger do? Mm. He said, well, I would be angry. I said, no, 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 no. I said, now, the little town, Forest City, North Carolina, Appalachia, where I went to high school, our high school had four rooms, okay, a principal and four teachers. Across town, less than a half mile away, was Cool Springs High School with more than 100 rooms and perhaps 50 teachers. And I said, I'm not angry. For one reason is, I've never heard, this was in 2001, I said, I've never heard of a presidential medalist coming from Cool Springs High School. Mm. And I came from Graham Town with four rooms. I said, I'm the blessing. Yes. <laughs> I'm the real American. Right. Because I too sing America in that sense. I am the example of what it can be. What can be, what was produced. And so those schools were reserved for whites only. But in many ways, I, I'm not holding up segregation or anything like that, don't get me wrong. But I got a good education because I had good teachers. Mm -hmm. And they went off. I had a fourth grade teacher who had a doctor of education from, Michigan, from East Lansing, Michigan State University. And that continued because you went on to go to Howard? Went on to Howard, got on the, got on the train. <laughs> Predominantly black institution. Black institution. Called the Black Harvard. Well, we called it the capstone. Oh, okay. The capstone of Negro education, but it was referred to as the Black Harvard. And when we wanted to go downtown, and Washington was segregated then. This is 1949. Only three places in Washington where a black person can go and sit down at a restaurant and eat in 1949. National Gallery of Art, thank God for art. The Severin Restaurant at Union Station, mm -hmm. and the Methodist Building. So all the Methodists out there, be grateful you were ahead of your time. You could go to those three places and eat. You couldn't even eat at a people's drugstore counter. They'd call the cop. We don't serve coloreds. I said, well, we don't eat them. Hmm. You know, and then dash out, <laughs> take off. We take off, right, go in and sit and then take off. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, it is funny now, you look back at it, but this was life in those days. And I got on the train because my teacher said, we didn't have any counselors. Everybody taught math or whatever, and he said, go to college. So 18 of us in that, in that 24 got on the train, went to college somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I went to Howard three weeks after they had already been in session. We didn't have any instructions. And, and I, you know, my report caught up and went on up to Howard and, and said, I'm here to go to college. And they looked at me like I'd come from Mars. Mm -hmm. But they said, young man, you don't just go to college, you have to make an application. And I said, well, I'm here, give me one. Well, I don't think they knew what to do with me, but they didn't call security. Mm -hmm. And I sat in, I went to, started going to classes. Did you have any idea that you were going into an environment that had professors like James Porter, Lois Melu Jones, Elaine Locke? Any idea that they were present and what that would mean? I had never heard those names. Yeah. I, I wasn't even sure that I had an act, a great interest in art. I was going to major in history. So I just went and started sitting in on history. I was the first city in, not the Greensboro. <laughs> You're the first city in. <laughs> yeah, I sat in on history classes. They, were, they call it auditing the class now, but go. They on. would call it auditing, but they knew the teachers knew I wasn't enrolled properly. Um, but they didn't ask me to leave. They wouldn't let me take an exam. And I wrote home and I said, I'm in college. <laughs> so. Got some jobs working in college, drove a cab for a while, right? <laughs> well, thank God for, for the women who look out for crazy men. And 
I'm going to college, and finally, Miss Fox called me and says, I want to see you in the registrar's office. And I go in, and Miss Fox was an interesting little lady. She seemed like she was inebriated all the time. <laughs> but she was well enough to tell me what to do and what not to do. And she said, sit down, son. I'm going to tell you. She said, now, first of all, you don't just come to college. She said, you have to make an application. And she went through the whole thing. I'm not paying any attention because I'm in college. You're there. I'm there. And she said, but if we were on the quarter system at that time at Howard, she said, if you don't come back, this is in the fall. School had been in session three weeks now when I arrived. She said, if you don't come back until January, I will personally usher you through the whole process. I said, thank you. And I went on back to class. And, but I saved my little money, and I did go back in January, and I was properly enrolled. Mm -hmm. And you did some part-time work as a cab driver, didn't you tell me that? I was a cab driver. Were you driving Langston around Howard? Well, not until, I didn't drive Langston later. Hughes around until he came back to receive an honorary degree. And by that time, I was a faculty member ah, at Howard. Okay. That was 1963. Oh, I got that mixed up. Okay. Yeah, that was a little later. But I'm on my way to... to, to are we going to get there? We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. So you are studying with James Porter. He is uh, the author of probably the first uh, official text on African-American art, modern Negro art, done in 1943. I think he had... He was a graduate student when he started. That was his graduate he, thesis. That was his uh, graduate um, uh, thesis mm -hmm. at the uh, Institute of uh, Fine Arts Institute in NYU. But it was published, um, he got his degree in 39, but it was published in 1943. Ah, okay. So I, I, I'm not arriving until later, but by that time he was a uh, professor at Howard. I didn't know him. Uh, James Wells was there, Lois Jones, but James Herring was the chairman of the department. And in those days, you know, the students wanted to, Washington was still a segregated city. We couldn't, we had to go upstairs to go to movies downtown, F Street, what have you, unless we uh, pretended we were African. Mm -hmm. African students could go to uh, walk right in, you know, speak French or something. We'd go down and say, Don't you want to believe? <laughs> and he said, Ticket, you go right on in, you know. Uh, but if you he just said, that. Can I have a ticket? And they'd like call the police. Uh, so we learned all of the tricks. And, you know, the, the women who could pass were passing. We'd see them going in and out. Say, Isn't that. So no, that's not, oh yeah, I know her ashes if I saw them. That's who it is. We did all those things of passing and I, I wasn't able to, but you know, the people with fair skin and what have you, we, we defeated the system. Mm. And the, the thing about it is the whites didn't know it. And then they had this privilege of recognizing Africans, you know, Oh, Africans could stay in hotels. That oh, yes, segregated. yes, but we yeah. couldn't. But not African-Americans. So we got the word, if you ask for it in French, you get in. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody was stupid. You still speak, you st you still speak bad French. <laughs> <laughs> they understood me enough to give me that <laughs> ticket. <laughs> but then, and I'm getting ahead of the story, but later on, I you know, get recognized for my lectures and what have you. The State Department and uh, Smithsonian asked me to go to South Africa in 1972 as a guest curator. And I get there and I take the work, and you'll see his work in the exhibition, William H. Johnson. I take a one-person exhibition of the work of William H. Johnson to the South African National Gallery of Art, apartheid. In 1972, I can't stay at the regular hotels. I have to stay at the best mm -hmm. of South African hotels because they can't guarantee my safety. Right. But then you, had, you, had, you were honorary white. You had that on your passport, right? Well, not on my passport, but on my papers. I didn't know that until somebody told me because I couldn't read Afrikaans. And so, um, but... The irony of this, I'm taking the work, just like you have the Harlem Renaissance show here, William H. Johnson's work only, 
to the South African National Gallery of Art as curator. And I'm treated like I have been doing this all along. You know, they could turn it on and off as they liked it. But, but not shown at the National Gallery of Art here in Washington. We had the first showing one person exhibition of an African American at the National Gallery of Art in Washington in 2003. Now, they are my friends. I love them. Mm -hmm. And they know I love them. But that's history. Mm -hmm. And the denial of history, as we see it going on on the national level, and I'll leave it there, that's the worst thing that could be happening. It was Winston Churchill said, if you deny it, you're going to go back and make that same They'll mistake. So hopefully. But with, but with that in mind. Pardon? With that in mind, yes. you have. James Porter and Lois Malu Jones at Howard. Yeah, yeah. And they are fighting over you, so to speak. Well, by that time, I started painting. I left. Porter comes in and sees me. I'm drawing one day in Professor Wells' class. And he looks over my shoulder and he says, What is your name? He said, I haven't seen you here before. And I tell him, David Driscoll. And he says, Oh. He says, What is your major? I said, History. And he looked at my drawing and he he said, you don't belong over there, you belong here. So I went and changed my major. That was the beginning of the art history. That was the beginning of art history and art in general, with the exception of the course I had taken with Professor Well. I've always been of the opinion that one should take the leap of faith if it meant improvement. Mm -hmm. And that's what it meant for me. Uh, now, in that environment, your talent was being recognized mm -hmm. and abilities, and you were offered a scholarship, a very rare scholarship to Skowhegan and painting. I think it had only been two African Americans that had been to Skowhegan as students up to that point, if I'm not mistaken. You were one of two. Well, I think maybe three ahead of me. That was 1950? 1950, 53. The school was founded in 1946. The first African American uh, was a gentleman who is now 95, and uh, he is still painting, and he's a puppeteer. He's a, he writes children's books. Uh, Ashley Bryan, who lives in Maine, he went to the school in Skowhegan, Maine, in 1946. He was the first African American to go there, and I was about the third one, maybe. Uh, Howard had a tradition of sending his graduate students there. And I was a junior when I went there, and I was the very first in that category. And I was, I guess, what they called a teacher's pet. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had the good fortune of being close to all of those teachers at that time. Including and, Lois Melu Jones. Including Lois Melu Jones. Who was very famous for her painting, A Sin of Ethiopia. Yes. During the Harlem yes. Renaissance period. She was one of the first African Americans in the 20s, really, after the Harlem Renaissance. She's not Harlem Renaissance, but she... It looked just shortly after. Yeah, yeah. she was one of the first to really stick with the African theme and the accent of Ethiopia. Here she is here. Okay, yeah. yes. Lois. But you, you're dealing with uh, teachers and mentors that still have the spirit of the Harlem Renaissance. Yes, they had work worked and, their and had worked with Alan Locke, who came to Howard. And with others, to they had worked as illustrators for Opportunity Magazine, Crisis, The Crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So they had these relationships already set up when I met them uh, at Howard. And um, the name Howard, incidentally, you know, uh, there were times when it was uh, a curse because you said Howard University then the assumption was, well, he knows nothing about American culture, period. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, it was uh, a blessing. You go, go downtown sometime if they're having a big concert, and let's say the Harvard Glee Club was in town. The Harvard Glee Club, they say, the Harvard. I and mean, you had to go to the door and, and, and announce your class. And we'd go in and say, Howard, 1955. <laughs> and they said, you know, use Howard, Howard. You know, they think you were saying Harvard. 
<laughs> go in, and without, you got in yeah. without paying, you know, just go on in. So. Well, with working with, uh, you know, James Porter and Lois Millie Jones, I think they, they transmitted to you this sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, you did arrive, and that's why I talked about your past a little bit and wanted you to go back, is to let everyone know that you arrived with a certain kind of uh, sense of pride and um, a sort of right, race pride, that I, I could demonstrate that I come from some place of value. I had value. Mm -hmm. You weren't walking around without a doubt about your value. You had value. But with uh, Porter and with uh, Lane Locke, they also gave you a different kind of ch challenge. I think you told me that Porter said to you that you had a responsibility. Mm -hmm. There was something special that you could do. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, both Professor Herring, who founded the art department, it was just the first major art department at a black institution at Howard University in 1921, and he remained chairman of that department until 1953, so I overlapped with him. And he was a cantankerous old man that just, uh, if you weren't really the best, he didn't even want to speak to you, mm -hmm. you know. I remember I was painting away at this portrait, and he came through the classroom, and I didn't know who he was, because we weren't introduced to the chairman. And I was painting a young lady, portrait of a young lady, and she had on a blue sweater and everything. And I really thought I was doing pretty good. And he came over and he pointed to the arm. He said, you'll never paint a better seascape in your whole life than what you painted there. And I'm like, who is this, this character? So this was Jane Vernon Lee Alphonsus Joseph Augustus Herring. And we would recite his whole name when we wanted to embarrass him. Uh, Professor Jane Vernon Lee Alphonse Joseph Augustus Herring, why did you say such and such a thing, you know? And by that time, he was angry with us. <laughs> but he, he was a good chairperson. He was good. He brought the arts center front at Howard University, mm -hmm. and he hired good people. He hired Porter, who had been one of his students. He brought Wells in from the Harlem workshop. Um, up, in, up in Harlem. He brought Lois Jones there from uh, the, the, um, the girls' school down in Sedalia, North Carolina. And he hired good people. But he didn't... Um, well, these were brilliant minds all at that one institution. They had no place to go. Mm. Harvard didn't want them. Sure. Sure. Yale didn't want them. The first people to break out were people like James, uh, like uh, John Hope Franklin, going to Brooklyn and, and, sh and Chicago and places like that. They didn't, they didn't have any room for black professors. So they were there fighting amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And I was, you said, uh, I was like kind of chosen. Yeah, I was there. I had a little talent. So Porter came to me and he said, and he very seldom did this, he said, it's noble and wonderful you want to be a painter and you're going to be a good painter. He said, but you have a good mind and you ought to study art history as well. He said, because we need you to help define the field. So I was at least smart enough to know that he was in a sense passing the mantle. Was mentoring, sure, sure. It was mentorship that he met. As soon after graduation, you had your first position was at Talladega and then at Talladega, I was very fortunate and Thanks to Porter for helping me write the letters. I, uh, I wrote my first letter to Talladega College, Talladega, Florida. And Professor Porter said, I don't think it's in Florida. But I said it out anyway. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you know, you, had, you didn't have this automated mo uh, mail system. So the, the, the letter went to Florida. And the postman marked it out and said, try Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and it went to Alabama, <laughs> Talladega College in Alabama. And the president, Dr. Arthur Gray, got that letter through all of that. And he, re he wrote back. Now, I have a bachelor's degree. I don't have a master's. I'm going to teach college. Mm -hmm. I had these grand ideas from day one believing in myself. Sure. <laughs> and so he wrote back and he said, regrettably, we don't have an opening, but we'll keep your letter on file. He's, and um, so about two months later in the summer, 
Dr. Gray writes back again, and he says, our art professor, Mr. Claude Clark, Claude Clark. Yeah. has decided to leave. He's going to Oakland, California to go back to graduate school. Would you be interested in coming? And I said, yes. You know, my wife and I, we had two little girls. And uh, as far as I was concerned, I was ready to teach. So I go down and he said, well, can you teach drawing? Yes. Can you teach painting? Yes. Can you teach ceramics? Yes. Hadn't had a ceramic course. <laughs> um, and went down the line. Of course, I bought a ceramic book that night and started studying ceramics. And I stayed a page ahead of my students. Mm -hmm. But I was so devoted to that teaching job that I learned to take my students out to the red clay mm -hmm. of Alabama to dig it, to process it, to fire it, to make our own glazes. And I sent uh, st students who were like economic majors to Cranbrook Academy for their MFA. Mm -hmm. So I say today, those people who say, well, isn't it time for us to close the HBCUs? No, no, no. Those HPUs, HPCUs are still fulfilling a function. Those kids can't come to Ohio State University. They wouldn't qualify to come. Sure, yeah. But if you give them a chance, mm -hmm. they will work their way up. Sure. And then they'll come to graduate school at Ohio State University. So they're still functional. They're still needed. And that was Just the kind of environment that I, when I left Howard, I went into. But I. I taught those courses, and I think I taught them pretty good. well. And then you went on to Fisk. I went on, there. no, I went to How, back to Howard back to, to Howard. teach. And I taught at Howard and became acting chair there when Porter went to Africa. And I left Howard in 1966 to For go to Fisk. Fisk. And, and now Aaron Douglas was at Fisk at this time. Aaron was at Fisk. He was retiring, and so I took Aaron's place. And but Anna Bontemps was still there. Langston Hughes would still come down to visit uh, Anna Bon Tomps and, and, um, and his wife. Uh, and uh, so I, I had made the acquaintance of, of Langston Hughes when I was a student by working at the Bonnet Aden Gallery. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't have remembered me from Adam, you know. But when he came back to Howard to receive an honorary degree in 1963, uh, the dean of the college uh, asked if I would drive him around the city and so I did. I wasn't driving a taxi then. Mm -hmm. I had my own car. Mm -hmm. So I drove him around. He wanted to go back to, the ho to see the hotel where he stayed over near the Calvert Street Bridge. I took him over there. And then he wanted to go see Georgia Douglas Johnson, the last of the Harlem Renaissance poets who had moved to Washington. And she lived down on 13th Street near T Street. And he said to me before we got there, he said, now, she is going to have lemonade in her refrigerator. She's going to have peppermint candy. And he outlined all the things that she would have. He said, the, the, the lemonade is going to be cloudy. He said, because she will have had it for a long time. <laughs> it was like, don't drink it. He said. <laughs> The candy, the peppermint candy is going to be pink. The stripes will be gone. She said she's had that since she worked for Booker T. Washington. <laughs> he said, don't eat it. So we get to her house on 13th Street, which I think they're trying to make into a national treasure now. It doesn't have anything to do with my being an artist, but you know, it fits in the Harlem Renaissance thing. Um, and we go in. And you can't get into her living room because she has books and, and papers and uh, piled up in the door. So you have to go all the way back to the kitchen and come through the dining room. Dining room is clouded up with books and things. And as you get into the kitchen, there's this refrigerator with that big round thing on top and making noise, mm, you know, going and so forth. And so we go in and we go in the living room and we sit down. Here, sure enough, here comes the lemonade. <laughs> here comes the candy. And so and I'm saying, now, how are we going to do this thing? And he said, well, when she goes back to the kitchen, we'll pour the lemonade in the flowers. Mm -hmm. 
this is, these are the little things, you know, that here's this great poet, poet laureate of black America, Langston Hughes, and he is conniving and, and, and telling me how to not get sick drinking his lemonade. So when Georgia Douglas Johnson, prominent name in, in Harlem Renaissance literature, she goes in the kitchen and, and so we pour the lemonade in the flowers. And of course, we've hidden the candy by that time. And so she comes back, she's more lemonade, you know. <laughs> and, so, and so that's how we got out of drinking the lemonade. But to sit there and hear them talk mm -hmm. about James Weldon Johnson, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, and Charlotte Osgood Mason, the famous, um, the woman uh, who really was the underwriter for much of the Harlem Renaissance, mm -hmm. the white woman who, mm -hmm. whose uh, people owned the big department stores in New York, and she had money to burn, and how she maneuvered to make this thing the way she wanted it. They had to do it undercover mm -hmm. to make it theirs because and, she and you paid. Tell me Langston would have to go out with her at night and oh yes, uh, yes, her he would places. have to be locked arm in arm with her at times. Uh, but, you know, that was the uh, tenor of the time. Mm -hmm. The patronage system. They, she was the patron. And but you had other patrons like Mary Beatty Brady of the Harmon Foundation. Mm -hmm. But Miss Brady didn't have as much money. And she was very selective. But plenty about of attitude. It. And a lot of attitude, yes. And she wore hats, so she had attitude. Attitude, okay. <laughs> so she, you also received one of the last awards from the Harmon Foundation. One of the last awards, and um, in 1964, and to my recollection, because the foundation closed in 67, I don't think they gave money to any other. And they had sponsored Palmer Hayden, it was early as Palmer Hayden and Woodruff and people like that. Yes, sir, Harmon. And, uh, title in the show. and Palmer is represented in your exhibitions. A beautiful work of his in the exhibition of People on the Subway. And I mm -hmm. was saying to Will, I don't think the subway has changed in New York. It's the same, you know, it's that impersonal, you know, mm -hmm. thing of getting on the subway, everybody doing sure. their own thing. So talk a little bit about this patronage system. It wasn't just uh, uh, black artistry. There were patrons like Carl Van Vechten, mm -hmm. uh, Mary Brady and others. I know there were actors that were very supportive. Uh, Robertson, Edgar Robertson was a very supportive of the arts and others. Lena Horne, uh, not Lena Horne, but Lena Turner, the actress was very supportive of the arts by blacks. So it was something that was really broad. But they were patrons on their own terms. Mm, okay. This was not a black owned So it was entertaining to them in some ways. Yes, it was still, it hadn't, it hadn't moved from the level of entertainment. It was like, you know, it was almost, it was a higher level, but it was almost like the, the slave owner on the plantation saying, sing me a ditty. Mm, got it. And they, you know, and the slaves were saying, uh, everybody talking about heaven ain't going. You know, that reverse psychology. <laughs> Well, Langston and all the others, they needed patronage. So, and Aaron told me, Aaron Douglas told me, he said, yeah, we would, he said, we had no other means of funding. He said they were so particular about how you could get onto WPA and so forth, and somebody sure. could report on you and you'd be off. And so Charlotte Osgood Mason, her money, they could go places, they could do things. Yeah, I know Langston used to stay in, in uh, cottages on private estates, the oh, right. Yes. and yes. Yeah, he was look after, looked after in many ways. But Mary Brady was also had a, a, a you know, sort of a uh, complicated relationship with patronage and supportive artists. I understood that artists would have well, to present works to her satisfaction. And she would collect the works. She'd give them a little money for them. and. For the time, it was decent money, I guess. But she built up the largest collection of works by uh, black artists in that period. And that's why the Harmon works, if you go to the um, 
uh, Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington used to be called the National Collection of Fine Arts. That's what it was called when she gave the works in 1970. The foundation closed down. She gave over 1,100 works by William H. Johnson alone to Smithsonian. Nobody, regardless of what you say about the, uh, the patronage or how Mary Beatty Brady ran the Harmon Foundation, who saved 1,100 that, works by work, William H. Uh, Johnson. Right. You gotta look at it from both points of view. And, um, but they were given on her own terms. Like when I, you mentioned Talladega, when I was at Talladega College, I wanted to do a show of the works of African-American artists in 1958 for the Fine Arts Festival. And I wrote to Miss Brady and she willingly sent, oh, about 45 or 50 works. And I remember the president praising her, saying these works have been sent to Talladega College, but he hadn't seen the fine print in the letter of the gift at the time. It said, during the incumbency of David C. Driscoll. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Brady always did that. If she liked you, she would point out, yes, these works come to you at Fisk, come to you so and so and so, but you better read the fine print. If I left, the works had to it's leave. going with you. Well, there were other patrons that did this too, uh, supported the institutions like at Fisk, the gifts from uh, Alfred Steglitz and George O'Keefe. Yeah. I know they gave a large collection and you were in charge of the, uh, the art gallery when you were at Fisk. Yes. So there came Ms. a time when yeah. uh, the works had been given yeah. with the understanding that they would never be shown in any other location. And then you received notice from George O'Keefe that she wanted to borrow some works for an exhibition? Yes, one of the conditions of the gift in 1949, Mr. Stiglitz died in 1946. And so, you know, Miss O'Keefe was a very uh, political person. She was a cultural icon, but politics was also there. Mm. And she was a, a mover and a shaker when it came to that kind of, of, of um, cultural enterprise. And she told me that she placed, people say, why would she give 101 works, Blue Period Picasso, Renoir, Cezanne, you name it, uh, 10 Marston Heartless, and so forth. And so nothing like it in the South. Why would she give 101 works to a little black school in 1949 in Tennessee. And she told me, she said, first of all, because it was a cultural gift. Black students need to know about these artists like everybody else. She said, but she also placed it there because the white people across at Vanderbilt and Peabody and all of the mm -hmm. um, Sadidi schools would have to come across the railroad track to, to see, see the to works. See and she said, you know, let them be humbled mm. and come and see greatness. So for all those years, for 20 years, of course, white community refused to come over there. They preferred ignorance. Mm -hmm. And so they stayed over there and showed inferior works. Mm. They could have come across the street and seen a blue period Picasso. They didn't do that. So George O'Keefe proved her point. But she also tied the collection down where she said, you can't loan it. You can't sell it. And I don't know what Miss Walton did, but they they did something, and they, <laughs> it's partial ownership now between Fisk and Crystal Bridges Museum. Uh, I'm not going to say anything unkind about it because, you know, uh, Walmart has been buying art. Mm -hmm. so, A lot of it, yes. You know, you can be bought off if you, you know, you pay the right price. I'm not saying that for real, but... Uh, <laughs> um, She's cleaning that up. <laughs> <laughs> but can, let's get to Georgia O'Keeffe. Now, okay. she says well, to you, she needs to borrow this painting. She sees, radiator, I, is it a radiator building? Yeah, yeah. She, I had 
gone to her in 1966 and said, the works are in bad condition, they need to be conserved. They hadn't been cleaned, and you know, and you could go to the linoleum on the floor, and that was Miss O'Keefe's red mark, still there in front of the Blue Period Picasso, in front of the Mott's and Hartley, and so forth and so on. They just waxed over it, and, mm. and so the works, you know, no air conditioning, no humidity control, and nothing like that. So I said, we need to improve upon the quality of the place and the care of the works. So I've gone to the Wilderstein Gallery in New York and they promised me a prominent place to have a benefit. Can we do it? And she says, no. She writes back and she says, my dear Mr. Driscoll, Stieglitz never felt that the works improved with travel and so forth and so on. So two years later, 1966, she's planning for her big retrospective at the Whitney. And I get a call from Miss Doris Bree, who was her assistant, and she says, Miss O'Keefe wants to borrow a radiator uh, building for the upcoming exhibition at the Whitney. And I said, well, um, tell her to put it in writing, send me a letter. So she did, and I wrote back and I said, my dear Miss O'Keefe, <laughs> I must remind you of the stringency of your gift. Regrettably, the works can't be loaned. Um, well, I knew I hadn't met her at that time, and my plan was to meet her. And you knew that letter would provoke the meeting. Yes. <laughs> and it did. And so I get a call from Miss Bree, and I don't know if anybody in here ever met Miss Doris Bree, you'd never forget her. She was about six feet two in heels. And she looked down on little men like me. Mm -hmm. And she, and she kind of nasalized when she talked. And she called me up and she said, Mr. Dresco, Miss O'Keefe wishes to see you in New York immediately. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> so Miss O'Keefe always stayed at the uh, Stanhope Hotel, right across the street from the Metropolitan Museum. So I go up and I walk in and she has on the black dress with the white collar and the medallion and so forth. And uh, you know, I always say, what, what are you gonna say to an American icon? What are you to say? You meet somebody and I said, oh, Miss O'Keefe, I said, look so beautiful just as you did in those early photographs. She, well, she didn't, but. <laughs> um, she was still Miss O'Keefe. Uh, she was an American icon. So she said, oh, you like the brooch? You know, uh, uh, she said, uh, and it said, if you look on the photographs, it says, okay. It's a silver medallion, you know. And I, I said, oh, yes, yes. She said, Sandy made it for me. And of course, luckily I knew who Sandy was, Alexander Calder. So I didn't call him Sandor. I said, oh, Mr. Calder did a great job on that. You know, I just, you know, rubbled her up and everything. She said, well, maybe some, you like it. Maybe someday I'll give it to you. And Miss Bree stood up and said, Miss O'Keefe, we're giving away nothing today. <laughs> and that kind of dampened my spirits. But I said, now I'm from, I'm a sharecropper from Georgia and my people knew how to survive, to get through segregation, and all that kind of stuff. Now I got, a, I got an answer for her. And so I said, uh, well, let me tell you about the condition of the works and so forth and so on. And I said, Miss O'Keefe, you know what? It was noble of you to place these works, 101 major works, including the two that you did at a black institution in 1949. I said, but Miss O'Keefe, you didn't endow them. What did you expect was gonna happen to the works? And she looked at me, she said, you got guts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said, but I like you. She said, now what do you want from me? And I said, I want $50,000, I want so and so and so. And I, I had it all laid out. And by that time, Ms. Bree was just melting down. <laughs> and she turned to Ms. Bree 
And she said, Doris, she forgot my name. She said, I want Mr. Fisk to have a check tomorrow for $50,000 to restore those works. We had special delivery back in those days. Mm -hmm. We didn't have this new mail, whatever it is. And uh, the check came. It was there by the time you got there, huh? And I had an agreement with John Spencer, who was director of the National Endowment for the Arts then. And, and you know, and I say to these, to the young people, the artists out there now, you just can't be an artist and stay behind that canvas. You gotta learn to be a business person. You gotta learn to articulate, to talk the language. You can't just stand there and make pretty pictures. The world doesn't operate that way. You gotta learn more than that. Sure. And so, Ms. O'Keefe listened to me and gave that money. John Spencer, I had an agreement. He was director of NEA at that time. He said, I will go to my discretionary fund and match, match whatever it if you Ms. can get it. We restored those works, and it was the very first time they had ever been restored. Uh, and uh, that was the part of the episode. But the last time I saw her was at her opening at the Whitney in 1970. And uh, they had a, a big, they had dinners all over New York, you know, the collective celebrating her being in town. I was not invited to the dinner where she was, but I was invited to one of the major dinners there on Fifth Avenue because I was a lender. Mm -hmm. I had loaned <laughs> a work. So I arrived, people were in their, you know, turkey suits and now doing all their things. And I arrived and um, this is New York City now. I hope there's nobody in here from New York. But um, I'm coming in from Nashville. I have on my little tuxedo. Everybody arriving in, uh, arriving in limousines and what have you, and Fifth Avenue and all that. And I get out, I arrive in my taxi, and I get out, and the doorman greets me on Fifth Avenue in the 1000 block of Fifth Avenue. And he says, are you reporting to work, sir? Mm -hmm. 1970 in New York City. And I said, no, I'm a guest of the Marcellus, and isn't it your responsibility as a servant here to show me to the elevator? And of course, yes, sir, and he did, and I went up, and then the conversation ensued about segregation in the South. Like, the come yeah. on. Yeah, that was a conversation upstairs. Upstairs, with all that mm -hmm. high China. Mm -hmm. So this patronage system was very critical because Brady arranged for exhibitions to come to Fisk. And this also is where you develop your first plans for two centuries yes. of African-American art, which yes. was a seminal text, an exhibition that traveled, I think, to four locations. Four, four started members. out at uh, LACMA. Los Angeles Los County, County Museum, Museum of Art. At the largest attendance record in that history, 80,000 people came to the exhibition. It was the first comprehensive exhibition of African-American artists put together. Then it went on to the High Museum. High Museum in <coughs> Then it went to, was it Dallas? The Dallas Museum. And then uh, uh, Brooklyn Museum. And ended at the Brooklyn Museum um, opening in July of right. 1977. And they, they had you all over the world doing interviews and filming. And it was well, such most importantly, place. I think, was the interview that uh, Tom Brokaw did with me on uh, Today's Show, uh, on July 4th, 1977. He was in Europe uh, just prior to that, and I forget the gentleman's name. He wanted to do the interview. He used to be on the Today Show with a big beard and big head of hair and so forth. And, and uh, anyway, he wanted to do that, and Tom Brokaw said, no, no, I want to interview him. And so I arrived for my interview and Brokaw, in his interview, said to me, um, well, he was talking about black art and so forth and so on. He said, but Hilton Kramer, you know, the leading critic, 
in America at the time, the New York Times, Kramer had literally put the show down saying there was such thing as black art and what is he talking about and blah, 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 you know, he went on. But he had to take three-fourths of a page in the New York Times to say that, right? to say that and put me down. And my chairman in Maryland by that time, and I went in the office that morning and he said, you made the New York Times. You know, nobody has made it before, you know. I said, but look what he said. He doesn't matter what they said. You made the New York Times. <laughs> well, <laughs> but Kramer said, you know, first of all, no such thing as black art, no such thing as women's art. I said, well, I didn't create those titles. I said, because of your sociological classification mm. and because we have to categorize everything, why can't we just say it's art? I'd like for it to just be American art, but no, no. I'm going to make sure it's in the compendium. And if it takes calling it black art to do that, I'm going to call it black art. And so um, Brokaw says to me, but Hilton Kramer says so and so and so. And I very innocently said, who is Hilton Kramer? <laughs> <laughs> On national television. <laughs> And of course, I knew that would start a fight. So Kramer lit in to me. Oh, that was on then, huh? Like white on rice. <laughs> and uh, so by that, uh, Sam Hunter over at Princeton had yeah. written about, he, in a book, he devoted 12 pages. This was the premier historian in the country. Yes, so. 12 pages to two centuries. So Hilton Kramer, you know, two weeks later, right? Why would a reputable historian like Sam Hunter. Hunter write about so and so and so? So my response was, Mr. Kramer, please, don't you know what you're doing? All you're doing is keeping my name in the New York Times. I'm becoming famous. <laughs> Keep it up. Well it, well, it did make you famous. It didn't make me famous. Yeah. No, no. Well, the, the book, the publication and the uh, uh, exhibition was critical because I've, I've been in the company of David where so many prominent historians have pointed out that their careers were based on that book and what David had did. He had given them inspiration. And that refers back to the lunch we were talking about earlier about the ideal that how do you inspire someone? by showing it, by doing it, and by witnessing. That's how you do it. I'm gonna close, because I know we have some time for questions. If I don't, Dave is gonna keep on doing this. We'll be here all night long. You can see where he received uh, an award, the National Medal for Humanities from President Clinton, to acknowledge and celebrate his distinct achievements as a singular man. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good question. <laughs> if I got my act together, it would be so, sir. Well, we, the Reed Yaron is a deputy director of the Driscoll Center, and she can facilitate that for you. If they aren't there now, they will. She be will make sure they're there for you. Um, I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, I always admire people who are, uh, and when your professor said to you, um, you're talented as an artist, but we also need your mind to define the field. Um, are you, I'm always a little sad that there, I know in the art museum business too, there are fewer, it used to be that art museums were filled with artists who were oh. also arts administrators and curators, mm -hmm. and this kind of cross-pollination between like art history, art, and, you know, and, and museum work, I, I, I'm sort of sad that that's less than it used to be. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see that that's a challenge for the future? 
Oh, definitely. It's a challenge. And it's, you know, we've compartmentalized things so now. You, be, you have to become a specialist in that particular thing, and you can't be. And I go back to the HBCUs. You couldn't be a specialist in those schools. And I was jokingly <laughs> saying at lunch, when I came to the University of Maryland, and this is factual, but it was almost within the context of a joke. When I came to the University of Maryland in 1977 to teach, there was one black full professor out of the 2,000 faculty members. I was the very second. And um, the, this whole thing about who is prepared, who is ready to do such and such a thing, and I'd come from HBCUs. I had taught at three HBCUs prior to that. And I come to Maryland, uh, a faculty, uh, art faculty of 46 people, uh, art historians and studio people, but everybody specialized. Now, they were specializing in things that I, at Talladega, at Fisk, and at Howard, had to teach across the board. So, um, you, to a certain extent, you lose something when that becomes such a specialty, and people stop talking to each other because they're not in the same field. You know, uh, get so bad sometimes the painters don't talk to the sculptors. You know, Ad Reinhardt said, "Sculpture? That's something you back into when you're looking at paintings." <laughs> 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 Um, <laughs> and it's almost that way, you know, like we don't, uh, we don't really connect. We're all there together and we're, we're losing some of that in the sense that uh, this is my field, this is my area. Um, I don't know what the answer is now that we have gone tech. That's pushed us even further. And as I was leaving, uh, I supposedly retired from teaching at University of Maryland 20 years ago. Uh, doesn't seem like it's been that long, but it has, because I still go up there. Mm -hmm. He makes me come on campus by being director of the Driscoll Center. I can't deny my name. That's right. So I have to go up there. Uh, but. They were putting in computers all over the place when I was leaving. This is 20 years ago now. And now you say, you don't have a computer in your office? Well, and I said, no, no, don't put one in my office. I'm leaving. And I got left behind in a lot of that technology. I can text and do a few of those things. Uh, but I, you know, don't ask me to do a lot of that other and that, stuff. And that's pretty recent, because you know, a few years ago, I got a text. I said, David Driscoll is sending me a text. He knows how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I say this, uh, you know, I have to go around the barn to answer the question. My, when I was teaching the students, one of the, they'd say to me, but Professor Driscoll, you were talking about science. I said, oh, yes, yeah, OK. I'll get back to that. Um, uh, you know, if you've lived 87 years, 87 and a half years, all that stuff is still there. Mm -hmm. And it's just coming, jumping on you. And you know, when are you going to say it? When are you going to use it? How much time you have left to use it? All that, you know, you try to get it all in in one sentence. It doesn't make sense. But I very often um, uh, get distracted by trying to bring the experience of all these things together. But finally, I'll simply say, it's something that we, you know, we do studies on everything. We ought to do some studies on the practicality of that and say that served us well at a given time when it was happening that way. I had a colleague at Howard, at, at uh, Fisk, Professor Earl Hooks. He was a wonderful ceramics teacher. And well read, and I often thought, well, he's outread me when it comes to the Greek philosophers and things, he'd quote Plato and Aristotle and so forth. I'd go get me a book and like, what is he talking about? You know. 
And Professor Hooks, though, would go off on little tangents. And he'd be talking about something, and then he'd just stop and say, hmm. And you say, Professor Hooks, he didn't hear you. Professor Hooks? And he's, oh, did you say something? You know, and my teaching very often was beginning to reflect that. Ah. So I said, no, no, it's time to stop. <laughs> time to stop. But keep in mind that David has also had a distinguished career as a painter when we talked about making that choice. Um, his work is currently at Brooklyn, a part of the uh, Soul of a Nation exhibition. He has a retrospective that will start in two years, begins at the High Museum, goes to the Phillips, Portland Museum, then the Perez Museum in honor of his 90th birthday. So he's always practiced at the same time that he has uh, done his work as an art historian. One question, I think. Hi. Um, my name is Demetrius David. And, uh, growing up, I was inspired by the uh, Harlem Renaissance, particularly the poet, uh, on a personal level. Could you speak to the um, collective impact that the Harlem Renaissance period had on America? We hear about the history, the purpose, the intent. Um, but I'd like to hear something about like, the collective impact on America. Mm -hmm. Well, it has, oh boy, that's a big one, because uh, so many people have been influenced. I have uh, experienced it vicariously in the sense that, uh, as Professor Holton said, I'm a child of the Renaissance in that I knew uh, the second generation people. I interacted with them. Uh, I was fortunate to have known Aaron Douglas, uh, and Alan Lopp called him the father of the Negro Renaissance movement amongst visual artists, and I, I knew him because of our relationship at Fisk and because of the work he'd done with the murals at so many different places. Um, but in the sense that the mantle was passed down to so many different people, it was the kind of thing that has impacted, uh, let's just say society, period. Let's not distinguish it and say black society. It's impacted society in certain ways uh, so that you can't really talk about uh, American literature mm -hmm. in its fullness without talking about Richard Wright or Zora Neale Hurston, uh, and, and, and of course, in poetry like Langston Hughes. And, and Langston always said that he was not trying to be a uh, poet laureate. He was trying to be a spokesperson for the people. And he said, when he wrote about simple, he was talking about the average person. And, and I'll tell you a story he told me. And if, if you ever come to Washington, there are a series of restaurants called Bus Boys and Poets. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, when I was driving Langston around in June of 1963, he wanted to go to what he called the Wardman Park Hotel, which is um, the big hotel up on the hill it's, um, what is the name of it now? It's one of those corporate names now, where College Art Association meeting was a couple of years ago. So I drove him up there and he said, um, he said, I was a bus boy here in this hotel. And he said, I was washing dishes and collecting dishes one night. And he said, I came in here and I saw the writer for the Washington Post who writes about poetry and literature and so forth. And he said, I ran back into the, um, um, the room uh, with the dishes and took a napkin and scribbled a poem out and took it back and handed it to, to the writer put it where he was. And a couple of days later, the writer wrote in his column in the Washington Post, 
I was at the Wardman Hotel, Park Hotel last night, and a Negro bus boy brought me a poem. He is destined to be a poet. So when you come to Washington yeah. and you go to the, the about four or five yeah, of the bus restaurant boys and chain, poets, yeah. bus boy and poets, that's the origin of that, that name. So it, so it echoes, yeah, it keeps echoing. It, it kind of echoes that, it, it gets out there where it's real. It's the word made real, you know, so. All right, thank you. And David will be available to talk. Thank you.